Right, okay, so um, I'm told that it's time to start. Um, hi. So, Disk Image Builder is one of the things we've built out as part of working on Triple O, which is deploying OpenStack on OpenStack. And I think it's sort of generally applicable for other people who want to deploy things with Heat and perhaps with other, other systems. But since you can make a talk about any one of those, I'm just going to talk about Disk Image Builder in the context of, of Heat deployed applications. Um, I'm a distinguished technologist at HP Converge Cloud. Um, I'm the Triple O PTL, and I recently got voted on to the OpenStack Technical Committee. So all of this to say, I really have no idea what I'm talking about, and I hope you guys can help fix up any preconceptions as we, we go through this talk. This is you know, the standard model talking about OpenStack. You've got your applications on top of a, a lovely compute cloud. And I have to use this slide in all of my talks. I've used it in so many now that if I took it out, it would be a betrayal of this, this continuity. When we started working on Triple O, the basic concept was to say, hey, what if all of the components of your OpenStack deployment were just applications? So everything you do to make deploying applications in an OpenStack cloud better will make deploying OpenStack itself easier and better and more, more straightforward. And to figure out you know, what, what are our needs? If these things are apps, what, what do we need as a deployment infrastructure for this sort of application? It needs to be a repeatable process that goes without saying. We don't want to deploy OpenStack by hand. You need to be able to deploy it without the internet. If you're bringing up a data center, you don't have the internet until you've brought up your firewalls, which are part of what you're deploying. And we need to deploy to bare metal. It's not something that Heat itself knows how to do. And what, and this is a scale thing, right? If you test one thing and then deploy another, you're setting yourself up for a huge face plant at some point because what you've tested worked and what you deployed didn't. And that becomes a real problem if new features are coming into your repository, whether it's Git or a package repository, faster than the time it takes to test and deploy because that means you either have to start locking and not letting things in while you test and deploy or by the time you've finished the test run and ready to deploy, what you deploy from that repository would now be different. Obviously, it needs to scale up and down. And I don't mean deploy a cloud and then make it bigger and smaller. I mean that you need to be able to deploy really big clouds, but you also need to be able to deploy a little dev test environment with a couple of machines in the corner. And we also had this interesting problem that suddenly things that often in the cloud you might consume as APIs, like databases, suddenly become an application that you have to deploy and make it act like a cloudy thing. So it has to be able to be thrown into hardware with no sort of manual preparation. And when we redeploy an image onto a machine, we need to preserve the important persistent data, the database, Swift data stores, uh, GlusterFS or Ceph uh, backend volumes. And uh, this final thing is if Triple O was to be a success, it had to be something that existing deployment communities could at, at minimum interoperate with. Ideally, it would be something that everyone can consolidate around to have one set of tooling. So we started saying, okay, so how do we evolve onto what we need? So heat, obvious no-brainer, it's the OpenStack service orchestration layer. Nova Bare Metal was coming along. We said, we'll, we'll jump on that. We'll work on it. That gives us instances on physical machines. Then we said, Okay, so how we've got disconnect here. Nova does disk images, everything else in the universe deploying in terms of repeatable automation wants to run with packages. So how do you get the sort of repeatable, it can roll back if you need, characteristics out of a chef and puppet environment? The answer that multiple organizations have come up with is you end up with a single custom package repository per commit that you're going to push through your chef or puppet infrastructure. And you end up with that because um, having a, a, a single lock held on a common app repository is actually a really bad idea because you end up with this big backlog and you can't work on multiple problems at once. So you want to fork it. And that's a problem. Um, it's a bunch of work. It's complex. And it's hard for people to really just quickly look at it and see what's going on. So. We said we don't really want to 
buy into that. That's going to be more than we want when we bring enough cloud. So we said, golden images, disk image builder. I mean, that's what I'm really here to talk about. And, oh wow. Ah, uh, yes, sorry, I, I just misread my own notes for a second. So the installation phase, building a disk image, that takes place with internet access. We can pull packages down from package repositories, we can pull stuff out of Git, we can pull stuff out of PyPy, and once it's built into an image, the deploy never needs internet access. So un unless you have a licensing server or something for some proprietary thing, but you'll have all the software already present on the disk image. And then final configuration takes place when you deploy it, Things that are always going to be the same in your environment, you might bake into the configuration on the, the image itself. Um, things like file paths for where databases are going to be are going to be pretty constant. Whereas how much of your cache, how much of your RAM goes to a database cache, you might auto configure that by looking at how much RAM is on the hardware you've been deployed to. And for folk that then want to use Chef and Puppet for their, their main system administration, just bake that into the image as well. And it can do configuration management, it no longer needs to do software installation. Uh, and CFN in it can happily deploy things. Uh, by which I mean, you run that as part of your Nova EC2 metadata and it can do arbitrary initialization code as part of early boot. So you boot up, um, it comes up, the cloud in it hands off to CFN in it, CFN in it says, hey, um, from the metadata, this is where your puppet master is, ask for a certificate, get hooked up, and after that, puppet can take over and do the, the administration of your machine. But we had this problem in Triple O again that we, we needed something that was going to be, um, we didn't want to exclude half of the deployers in the world that were using the, the other choice of Chef or Puppet in what we put in upstream OpenStack. So we did a minimal configuration management system. It doesn't know how to do installation. All it knows how to do is to collect data from a metadata source like EC2 or Heat or potentially Puppet Master or Chef Server. It knows how to trigger some scripts to refresh the configuration on a local machine and Ossupply Config knows how to write templates. And I've probably got extra slides for that, so for added redundancy. The point of the separation though is that you can take out the refresh config and the apply config and put Puppet or Chef in there and have that triggered from OS collect config and uh, everything should still just work. So, Disk Image Builder builds an image by going through a set of hooks. Um, we create a root image, we do some pre-installation, we do some installation, post-install, finalization, and so on. Each image build is parameterized by including elements. So, um, you can have an element for a particular piece of software you want to, to install, or you can have an element for um, bringing in some plugins for something so they can compose. They, don't, they should never replace each other. And each element includes one or more hook files in each of those sets of hooks I referred to before. So the Ubuntu element, for example, has a, a script 10 cache Ubuntu in root.d, which is how it drags the data out of an Ubuntu reference cloud image and puts it into a, a cache ready for disk image builder to, to build things. Elements can depend on other elements. So you can create an element that just says, I want to bring in these different packages and these other elements, and that's my definition I'm always going to use. I don't want to have to always pass the same parameters in every time. One of the things that configuration management systems do that we lose out by having our own thin layer is that they provide abstractions between different operating systems. And sometimes the difference is things between like apt and yum, different tooling to do the same basic job. And other times it's things like different defaults for where files are and so on. We don't have a really good answer for this other than if you're doing a large variety of different software, you might want to go down the route of bringing in Puppet or Chef as part of your, your image. That's why it's there as an explicit approach. Um, but for Triplo itself, what we've done is we've said, hey, this is a common problem. Let's just write a minimal contract, and then each operating system we support can supply that contract. So we have a script called install packages, which if you run install packages on a Fedora image, it will use yum. If you run it on an, apt, uh, an Ubuntu image, it will use apt. 
and we have a translation file there that says these are what packages are named in the different distros. So it just works. Finally, um, for performance, most of the things you install with Disk Image Builder get cached in tilde.image slash image create. So the base image from your vendor, the, the operating system, um, PyPy packages get cached, yum packages get cached, and this means that repeated image builds are pretty fast. We do recommend you have a squid cache or something similar as well, um, but it's not strictly needed. So with that sort of framework in mind, we also create a temporary file system to build the image in. So the, the build is entirely in RAM. Of course, if you're building on a machine with a, a low, low RAM, like 4 gig or something, that may be a problem. It can be turned off, but it makes builds much faster. We copy the contents of the base image, the Ubuntu or Fedora file system, into the temporary file system. We disable service startup because we're not interested in running anything. We just want to get the right files on disk. <laughs> Uh, we override resolve.conf and proxy settings, and you know this is a moving list as we find things we need to override, we'll override more for the duration of the build. We install the software as needed, and it's installed in the Chiroot, so software that doesn't play nice with Chiroots, which occasionally exists, does need special handling, but I think we've had to do that once so far, so it's not really a, a high volume problem. It's not something you should expect to run into. Then we make a sparse raw image with a file system big enough for the contents of the tempfs. We move the contents into the uh, raw image, and if you're doing a VM which needs a bootloader, we configure a bootloader, restore service startup, restore the proxy, pack it down into a QCAL2. This is actually the longest time on most of the straightforward image builds I've got is doing the compression into a QCAL2 file. It's slow. Um, and then you're done. You know, we unwind, clean up everything, make sure everything's unmounted, but that's it. That gets you your image. A couple of things to note. This is not Nova. We can trust these images. If someone wants to root you by giving you a bad base image, they can just ship a bad binary. They don't need to play monkey games with the file system they're shipping you. We create our own file system as we go. Um, for a couple of reasons. One, there were some really strange images that had like 10 gig file systems that we just couldn't unpack and develop as machines in a sort of reasonable time frame. Um, but also, it gives people who want to run different file systems in their image the ability to do so. If you want to run LVM, if you want to run um, XFS or something, it's not a change in the overall code flow, it's just a change for that one part of the, the, one part of the process. And was it Stephen Dake that did the heat wrapper for Disk Image Builder? Yeah. So Stephen Dake did a, a really cool hack. He wrapped all of Disk Image Builder and with, with custom elements, so you, you throw your own elements in, as parameters, in a heat template. So you can spin up a Disk Image Builder VM, build an image, and it uploads it to Glance at the end of it. And it's about 18 lines of heat template. So it's actually really easy to use that as a service. Um, you don't need to have a dedicated machine. Heat will just spin up a VM for you in your cloud, do the build, and upload it into the glance in that cloud. Um, so this is, I guess, all prelude so far. I've probably been boring people, as we can tell by folk leaving. So I'm sorry about that. Um, more important, how do you actually use this? So you need to export an elements path. You make a directory where you're going to put your elements, your customizations for your images, and the elements path tells Disk Image Builder how to find your elements. And it's a path so that you can reuse elements from multiple organizations and then just add your own in a new directory. You don't need to run a fork of other people's repositories. If you do need to replace an element with a fixed copy, for example, because it's a path, the first occurrence of any given element name is what's used, and just put your elements first in the path. Make a directory, give it a readme, because everyone needs documentation. I mean, really, you'll forget what it does if you don't give it a readme. So, um, Add any elements that you need to depend on to element depths, and add any hook directories that you need. Um, all of the scripts that I mentioned before are just shell scripts or Python scripts, whatever you like, and they should do what you would normally do, like install some packages, um, tweak some, some settings, delete garbage that's left by the install process, 
Things like license keys can be a bit interesting. If you need your license keys to come dynamically, you'll need to put that in your deploy time logic, so as configuration management scripts. If you can apply the license image when you build the image, then you should do that as part of your actual direct hooks. Um, I didn't want this to become a manual, so there's, there's a lot more documentation out in the disk image builder repository, and you can reach us on the dev list and, and so on. So to create an image, one line, this is the general format of it. Disk image create, dash A, what architecture? i386, AMD64, ARM, LE, or, or whatever. Dash O and a file name, so my, my, my image, and it will get .qcal2 appended to it, and at the end of the process that file will exist, and that's what you can upload to Glance. And then you provide one or more image elements to build. So, for example, this is how we build a um, Nova Compute node for Triple O. We take Ubuntu, we, this is for the dev test story, so this isn't production. Production, we make two changes to it. Um, we want Ubuntu, we want i386, we want the file to go into triple O root and be called overcloud compute, and we want Nova Compute, Nova KVM, Neutron, uh, OSCLIC, Config, DHCP, all interfaces. Um, and no Arch there is a typo, I'm sorry about that, I'll make sure that's fixed in the copy of the slides I, I put online. It shouldn't be there. <laughs> So one of the things we've found when people come along and they start contributing is they don't know what elements to use. So they, they read the docs and they say, hey, yeah, I want to do this thing, but there's a whole bunch of stuff that can make your life easier. So Ubuntu Fedora or Red Hat uh, RHEL, and there's a SUSE element coming, gives you, that's the operating system you're going to, to build. We don't do Windows builds today. There's some discussion going on about how we can make that happen. There's some interest in it. Um, I'm certainly very open to, to come up with a good solution for that. Although using wine in this does kind of scare me a little. So the VM element is interesting. We, historical reasons, and perhaps we should change this, but our default is to build just a single partition image, an image of one file system rather than of a full disk. And that's what um, Zen wants, because it wants detached kernel RAM disk image, and it's what um, Nova Bare Metal wants but it's not what most clouds want, which is an image with a VM in the boot block and they um, hand off through the um, BIOS layer rather than directly booting your, your kernel. So most people will want the VM element to be included. The source repositories elements, this is um, nice because you can, you can just write, hey, git clone something in your rules. But if you use the source repository elements, it will make a cache of it in tilde dot cache image create. And rather than pulling the whole contents every time, it just pulls down the incremental data and then copies that into your image. So much, much faster. If you're building Fedora and you're like me and you really don't understand SC Linux properly, you'll want to put it into permissive mode. So disable SC Linux. Um, pip cache is nice. It's not safe for concurrent builds because of bugs in pip, but if you, if you turn it on, it creates a pip cache. Every element, every image you build will have that cache mapped into it at the beginning of the build, and the cache gets updated by the build, so you don't down much, download much from PyPy or from um, the OpenStack PyPy mirror very, very quick. Uh, if you're building concurrent images, though, you need thread safety, and then you should use the PyPy element, which takes an actual local pip mirror and uses that instead. And there's a, um, an element that will create that for you, or you can use the OpenStack and for a uh, PyPy mirror project to, to build such a mirror. DHCP all interfaces is something we hooked up. It just interrogates the um, proc interface to find what interfaces you've got, which ones have link, and then adds stanzas to etc. network interfaces and brings them up. So most reference images only have ETH naught in their configuration. This lets you run, if you've got four neutron networks attached, they'll all come up, rather than you having to manually fiddle the image to do that, um, without using file injection. You can use file injection, of course, if you want to, but uh, I'm in the camp that considers file injection from a cloud to be an abstraction violation and not to be, not to be done. 
Um, PyPimera is an element that uses the PyPimera project from OpenStack uh, Infra, but it sets up a cron job. So this is really useful if you're deploying infrastructure to maintain your infrastructure. This gives you an automatically maintained mirror. Um, it's a little meta, but I, th I think it's a, still, still worthwhile knowing. At worst, you can look at its code to see how to run your own mirror by hand. Oscillate config, refresh config, and apply config, I, I touched on before. They aren't needed, but we think they're better than sliced bread. And there's been some discussion with the heat guys about actually getting oscillate config to replace CFN tools, in the, or at least CFN in it, in the sort of recommended path for working with heat. Um, I'll supply config is really, it's just moustache templates in a file system. It writes them out to the files they're going to end up on. Really, really super easy for getting the exact config you want. Um, finally, and, and this is really useful for being able to get onto an image-based upgrade process, use ephemeral. This lets you map stateful files into slash mount slash state. And if you're using a cinder block device and you're not using boot from volume, then all your, you put all your state into the cinder block device, which is available from different hypervisors after your, your instance crashes or the hypervisor goes offline. Um, and if you're on Nova BMS, you're using an ephemeral partition to get the same basic feature set. Um, caveats around this. If you're using boot from volume, you still need to have a separate volume for state. Or when you deploy a new golden image to your volume, you'll wipe out your persistent state. So it's, you still need to keep the separation. Um, now, CI. So when I spoke earlier, I said, hey, what you deploy has to be what you tested. This is really the point where I think golden images start to really shine. The rest of it is just, it's just swings and roundabouts, different ways of getting the software on, on a machine, right? A golden image encapsulates a full set of software. So if you test a golden image in your CI system, you, and you take that same image, you can deploy that, and it's an atomic unit. So you get away from this whole problem of having to have multiple app repositories with different points in time, or any of the other sorts of shenanigans you can play to try and make that work, like, like locking. So you upload the change to Garrett, Jenkins builds an image for you, you upload that image to Glance, and then you deploy a test cluster with heat. You upgrade the cluster to your new image, and you do that to make sure that any data migration logic you've got works, and you run a functional test against the cluster. You make sure your, your tests that the cluster is up and alive are working properly. Now, for different clusters, that might take different forms. It might be that you use uh, just your monitoring system and then a load tester, or you might actually have specific tests, something like Tempest. If tests pass, great, deploy to prod. You've done every single check you're going to do. You now know that that image is ready to deploy. You've got nothing else to do to get it ready for deployment. Or if they don't pass, go back and upload a new change to fix whatever failed. Um, so I've, I've probably timed the talk wrong is my feeling, but no, maybe not. So this gives us a repeatable, automated end-to-end -end process for deploying your application, for deploying it without race conditions. You can deploy it without internet access, so if you're in a secured environment, great. Um, not everyone is, but as I said, we developed this for O, where we did have that constraint. You can deploy it to bare metal. If you're deploying Hadoop, um, Savannah uses disk image builders, disk images, for example, built with disk image builder. Um, so you can deploy workloads on bare metal, and build your images during your CI, don't build them as something after you've run your tests, build them to run your tests on. Not your unit tests, your functional tests. All your scaling logic for scaling up and down is kept in heat, and here is one of the key, key points. Every single node in the cluster is identical. All of your, um, pro say, say you're deploying Swift, you've got Swift proxy and the Swift object store. All your proxy nodes are now running exactly the same software, the same kernel, uh, the same Swift version, every last little detail, without you having to do any additional work. It's just an emergent property from this approach. 
Um, persistent data, it's a bit of a work in progress. We want to make it nicer than what I've described so far, but that's really, I don't have an exact answer on how we'll make it nicer yet. And for the integration with Chef and Puppet that I mentioned, Red Hat have a proof of concept with, with Puppet, so it's doable. Uh, we probably need to do some work to make it nicer and, and easier to do without changing any of the Puppet rules at all. So, I, we've got 10 minutes for, for questions. Or we can just go out to the parties. Demo? Um, Steve. <laughs> Did you prepare one earlier? Right, so Steve Baker prepared one, and I went to, to run it against our triple O test cloud, and I found a configuration problem in our test cloud at, you know, an hour before I had to fly. So, no, I'm sorry. Uh, I can certainly show you building an image from that, but I can't show you it actually deploying. Um, for perhaps grab me later in the week. I'll hopefully have that configuration thing fixed. But then again, it's going to be a busy week. So. Something that comes. Oh, I'm sorry. Hello. Could you speak a little bit to the decision to treat the incoming base image as something that is not your concern? And is that how is that working out? Is it the assumption that it always comes from the vendor? How does how do issues of trust play into that, et cetera? Right, okay, so I guess I should start then that entire bit over. We, we don't want to run, we don't want to be in the business of figuring out how to run operating system installers and figuring out how to inject things into them. So that's sort of the first thing. That, that's a problem that operating system vendors already have themselves. Um, and because we want to be multi-vendor, we don't want to sort of have to figure that out again and again and again. Secondly, I don't think it's any more trusty, trustworthy to take an image that a vendor's created or to create, take the binary packages a vendor has created plus an installer script and run the installer script. If we can't trust the vendor to, to run their installer script themselves properly, that's, that's a real problem. And, and um, What we can be sure of, though, is that by taking an image that I've built and that they think is ready to run in a cloud, is we're taking the configuration they recommend for running in a cloud, and we're just going to tweak that to put our software on it to run in a cloud. So I think this is actually better than running the vendor installer, because it exactly we don't need to change our configuration when the vendor install says, hey, look, we're going to add in, um, I don't know, maybe we'll, we'll turn off, tweak the, the VM write back settings in the image by default for VMs. We'll inherit that automatically unless we actively go out of a way to disable it. Whereas if we just ran their installer, which is designed to install it to bare metal, we'd have to go and copy that change that they're doing to keep up to date. So uh, less maintenance for us. But it, there's another aspect, which is that if you want to edit an image you build, so you can build an image, and then you can say, well, we, we, we want really fast iterations. We don't want to wait three minutes for an image build. We want it in 15 seconds. Then that's doable with Disk Image Builder. Take the image you want to have as an iterative thing, tweak it so that you've, you don't keep it in a table, you keep it unpacked on disk, copy that in, turn off compression when you build the output. There's absolutely no way you're gonna run a full operating system installer in that sort of time frame. And another point is that I consider is that Ubuntu's latest cloud installer actually just does a disk image copy. So it's down to byte copy style thing. So they're actually getting away from having users run package management based installers as well. So there's, I think, we've kind of led the way on a change that I expect to propagate out across the industry as people go for more performance. 
Um, I think that's really, I think that covers your question. Oh, you asked how it's working out. It's working out fantastic. They build fast, <laughs> they're reliable. The problems we have so far is that Fedora seems to have some flaky mirrors that we find because we build a lot of images and the, the DNS round robin or, or DNS geolocation, whatever it is, every now and then picks a bad mirror and we have a failed build. Yeah. So I think that's not something we should fix. That, that's something to, to say upstream, hey, if you want people to use your mirrors, they need to be reliable. So you're having performance problems building images to image builder. And, and, and so I haven't figured that out really. Okay. Um, so I, I think we, we look at about three minutes for a, a null op build at the moment with compression. And I think it's like 90 seconds to unpack, do blah with disk.io and copy it back around. So I'd like to make that a bit faster, but it's tolerable. If, you, if that's not what you're seeing, then... It, there may be some other factors such as... Uh, uh, package endpoints, uh, repo locations, and, and the syslinux uh, invocation for the right. master boot record uh, manipulation. So we get a lot of profiling data out from um, the run D thing, the timings. So you should be able to look at those timings and see where the time's going, and then either file a bug or, or dig into it. Three, two, one, thank you. <laughs>